Good afternoon. I'm Peter Grinspoon. I'm a primary care doctor at Mass General Hospital in Boston, and I'm a board member of the nonprofit group Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, and I'm delighted to be here talking about uh, cannabis. Uh, what I was going to talk to you about today is um, what I view as the fine line between medical and recreational cannabis. Um, you know, medic medical cannabis came before recreational cannabis. It started in California, and in virtually every state, there are um, initiatives to legalize medical cannabis. And then afterwards, there, there are, are initiatives to legalize uh, recreational cannabis. And just as a backdrop to this talk, I want you to remember the groups that tend to oppose every single ballot initiative um, that comes up in every single state, both for recreational and for medical cannabis. It is the alcohol industry, because once cannabis is legalized, medically or recreationally, alcohol consumption goes down 10 to 20 percent. So it's a little bit ironic that the alcohol industry funds these scary ads about marijuana because uh, they, don't want, they want you drinking more alcohol. It's the private prison industry, um, and it is the pharmaceutical industry. And we'll get into why the pharmaceutical industry is so threatened by medical and recreational cannabis in a little while. So now 32 or so states have legalized cannabis in the United States for medical use. And about 90 plus percent of the US population is in favor of medical cannabis. Um, uh, most Republicans, most Democrats, most independents um, are in favor of it. Uh, it just seems like there's hardly anybody that's against medical cannabis right now. Recreational cannabis is only legal in about 10 states, and it is supported by two-thirds of Americans. And recently, it's now supported by 52% of Republicans. So now, most Republicans and Democrats um, and independents support recreational cannabis as well. So I believe that once we get a normal government in Washington, D.C., they're going to take cannabis out of the Controlled Substance Act, and we are going to have legalized cannabis recreationally and medically. But the question is, why is there more support um, for medical cannabis and, than there is for recreational cannabis? And is there really such a difference between medical and recreational cannabis? You know, as a primary care doctor, who takes care of people every day, I think uh, of the patients that I see, I, I certify people for, for medical cannabis. And you think of the hockey player who is a construction worker, or the recreational hockey player, I should say. He or she works all day in the construction site and then uh, comes home and has a backache from lifting heavy objects all day. Then he or she takes a puff or two of cannabis so his or her back doesn't hurt and then can go out and play hockey recreationally in the recreational hockey league. Now, is that recreational or medical? It's sort of in between. It's a combination of the two. Um, there's a great group in Massachusetts called CCRN that does research, among a lot of other things that they do, uh, headed up by Marion McNabb. And they did a huge survey of Massachusetts uh, cannabis users. And 38% of them, uh, can, you know, they said, how many of you use it for medical use and how many of you use use cannabis for recreational use. And the numbers added up to higher than 100%. And in fact, a lot of the people used it, they categorized themselves as using it for recreational and medical use. So it wasn't necessarily one or the other. And that got me thinking. And another thing that got me thinking is some very interesting data from the state of Colorado. When they legalized cannabis in Colorado, Recreationally, the per Medicare D prescription rates for all classes of drugs went down. Not only did the opiate overdoses go down, and not only did the opiate prescriptions go down, which is phenomenal if you're trying to address the opiate epidemic, and not only does alcohol consumption go down 10 to 20 percent when you legalize cannabis, which is um, a gold mine for those of us who are harm reductionists and trying to keep the population healthy, um, and again explains why the alcohol industry was so eager to funnel money into the anti-cannabis campaigns. But it is just really interesting that all of these other drugs went down. And um, I think that patients, again, they don't necessarily look at it uh, as recreational versus medical. Um, once they have access to it, say in Colorado, where it's legal both medically and recreationally, if someone has 
a backache. They can either wait to see their primary care doctor, you know, it takes like two or three weeks to a month to get in, pay a copay, pay the deductible, wait to see the doctor, get a muscle relaxant that makes them sleepy, they have to go to their pharmacist, fill a prescription, then they take this muscle relaxant which makes them sleepy and doesn't even work that well, or they can take a puff of cannabis. Um, if they're having sexual troubles, um, a female having anorgasmia or a male having erectile dysfunction, there are plenty of studies that show that cannabis improves your sex life. And instead of um, seeing your doctor, trying to get a prescription for Viagra, uh, which doesn't work that well, and insurance companies won't pay for it, people are taking a puff. And so instead of going to the doctor and spending money on these overpriced and uh, not that effective pharmaceuticals, people are using cannabis. Um, Another example is uh, insomnia. Um, what medications do doctors really have for insomnia? Uh, Ambien is like a dangerous drug. I prescribe it as a primary care doctor if I absolutely need to, but it has a lot of side effects. It, people wake up in the morning after taking Ambien and they've eaten their way through the refrigerator and there's a whole pile of wrappers and they don't remember eating. You're in kind of a dissociative state or they end up driving and they don't remember driving and their car's parked in a different space. And cannabis doesn't do anything like that. Not to mention the insurance companies give you such a hard time paying for Ambien. They'll give you, you know, I prescribe it for my patients and they'll say, okay, you could have Ambien for 15 nights out of 30 days. And it's like, what the heck are you supposed to do for the other 15 nights? And people are just taking a puff and falling asleep. So I think that, um, you know, people are, are self-medicating with cannabis and they're also using it, you know, um, for their aches and pains, maybe for boredom. It, it's really a fine line between when they're using it recreationally and when they're using it medically. Um, again, I think it's sort of a false dichotomy. Um, there's sort of implications on um, this. Uh, there are a lot of implications for people here today at the Harvest Cup. Some people um, are very, uh, get very upset at the idea that um, that uh, about the, the, the thinness of this line between the two because they're trying to make a living off of medical cannabis and they're sort of zealously um, sort of defending the idea of medical cannabis and I'm not taking a uh, position one side or other in this debate or this discussion I'm just like suggesting the possibility um, you look in the state of Washington the medical market collapsed when they legalized recreational cannabis. Um, to me, that suggests, uh, that's in line with the theory that there isn't that much of a difference or that fine a line between medical and recreational cannabis. Um, but it hasn't collapsed in other states, such as Washington, and it'll be very interesting to see in Massachusetts what happens now that we have recreational stores just starting to open up if there's still a big market for medical cannabis. Now, people will use uh, medical, will use marijuana or cannabis for medical reasons. It just is a question of whether it's going to be a discrete discipline of medical cannabis or whether it's just going to be cannabis that people use medically and recreationally together. Um, it, uh, what it does come down to, I would say as a primary care doctor, is patient wellness. As a primary care doctor, I want my patients to be well, to be happy, to be healthy, and to thrive. Um, when a patient comes to see me, they have a backache, or they're um, lonely, or they're shy and they can't seem to go out of the house, or they can't sleep. They don't care if they are going to use medical, use cannabis as a medical patient or recreationally. They just want help. They want me to help alleviate their symptoms and alleviate their, their suffering. So very frequently I prescribe cannabis. For example, for chronic pain, I prescribe it a lot. What else are we supposed to use for chronic pain? 100 million Americans are in chronic pain, it's estimated. And, um, you know, Tylenol doesn't do anything. Uh, nobody wants to be in opiates because you overdose and and you can get addicted, and even if you don't overdose or get addicted, they treat you like a criminal if you're on opiates these days. You have to get drug tests and be on narcotics contracts, and, and cannabis is so effective for chronic pain. Um, people are really adopting it, for, especially the baby boomers. So people want their pain cured, but they don't care if they're a medical cannabis patient.
location, or if they get it at the um, recreational store, they don't care what label it is, they just want to feel better and go on with their life. So again, I go back to the example of my patient who is a construction worker and he or she comes home, they're in pain, and then they want to go out and enjoy themselves and go dancing or play hockey or you know play with their kids or give their two-year-old a piggyback ride. Now, so if they take a puff or two, is that recreational or is that medical? To the patient, they're just trying to improve their quality of life, live a full life, and be well and be healthy. Um, a lot of people use cannabis before exercise. It helps them with their aches and pains. I, I saw a patient yesterday that had really bad rheumatoid arthritis, and um, he was on steroids, he was on all these really complicated immunomodulatory medications that cost thousands of dollars. I'm like, why don't you try cannabis? It'll probably help your arthritis. I don't think it's going to cure your arthritis, but it might help your symptoms enough so that you could exercise again. He really wanted to play soccer. He's from Latin America. And, you know, again, is this recreational or is this medical? He's going to try it. I'll bet he's going to feel a lot better, and I'll bet he's going to be back to playing soccer twice, twice a week. It's medical because he's going to help his heart and his cholesterol and avoid diabetes by exercising. It's going to help his sleep and his mood, but it's also recreational because twice a week he's going to be seeing his friends and playing soccer. So it's not easily categorizable in one way or another. It's all about, from the point of view of my point of view as a doctor, about wellness. It's not recreational. It's not medical. It's both. The answer is yes. It's cannabis and it's helping him in his lifestyle. And if you look at it this way, there's also another component. It's very... Um, very much about patient wellness. Um, not just about patient wellness, but it's also about um, patient empowerment. Um, as I mentioned before, our medical systems not only is very paternalistic, like there's the doctor and the patient. And you know, that's been changing with the patient rights movement over the last couple of decades. And patients have more empower, more empowerment and more education. And you know, certainly as a primary care doctor, I think the gap between patient and doctor is less than you know the almighty surgeon. So I think that helps. But um, with cannabis, people can treat themselves. Again, if they pull a muscle, they don't have to necessarily call the doctor, wait for the call back, go into the clinic, pay a co-payment, and get a medication. They can, they can try treating themselves. They can experiment. They can try different strains. They can journal. They can see what works. They can, if something works for them, they can stick with it, or they can try to improve upon it. They can do their own research. They can see what's on the menu at dispensaries. They can and they could really figure out what helps them for their different ailments. And then they could come in when they see me and we could discuss it. And, you know, ideally, um, what, what we really need is more doctors to be educated about medical cannabis because there's actually a real shortage of doctors that can have a conversation with patients. So the point I was making is that patients can really empower themselves. The limiting step, ironically, is the doctors. 90% uh, of patients are in favor of medical cannabis. Um, and I know I just made this whole um, argument that medical cannabis and recreational cannabis are somewhat of a false dichotomy, but just to hold on to the old terminology for a little while, 90% of patients are in favor of medical cannabis, but uh, doctors are pretty conservative about it. Now, that's starting to change. I just did a grand rounds on my old hospital, um, Mass General, or my current hospital, um, on Friday, and it was uh, very successful, and it was great to see the doctors being open-minded about medical cannabis. You know, there was a debate at the same hospital four years ago. There was a debate on medical cannabis, and um, four, uh, uh, ten minutes into the debate, someone raised their hand and said, are any of you guys in favor of medical cannabis or are all of you guys against it? And then there was like an awkward silence. And somehow they managed to have a debate. This was a different department. I, uh, there were no names mentioned, but it was a different department. And they managed to have four people that were very much against medical cannabis have a debate on medical cannabis. Now that's not a good way to educate doctors about medical cannabis, to find four people that are completely against it to quote unquote debate it. So I'm really glad that they're having, uh, that hospitals are, are starting to present a more diverse point of view on this issue. Um, it's very concerning, again, that cannabis is still on the Controlled Substance Act in the United States. It's listed as Schedule One, which means that it has, quote, high abuse liability, 
which isn't true at all, and low uh, or no medical value, which is obviously very laughable. We need the government to change that yesterday. Um, for the United States is getting very far behind other countries, particularly Canada, Europe, and Israel, in terms of research and development. Uh, we're losing jobs. We're losing expertise. It's, it's just pathetic how far behind our government is in terms of cannabis. We're making up some of this on the state level, but the state shouldn't have to do this. This is brain dead for a government to be so narrow-minded about cannabis. Is a government still in the 1960s where cannabis is the evil weed? So that's got to change immediately. But in any case, it's been it's very exciting to be here at the Harvest Cup and to see how the industry is flourishing. And when I say the industry, I don't mean you know necessarily the hedge funds. I see. Um, all the people that feel that they are able to incorporate cannabis in their lives in terms of wellness and improving their lifestyle and easing their aches and pains. You know, people are sleeping better because of it. They're relying less on sedatives. Um, I think that they're using it a lot to help their uh, sexual well-being. I think that a lot of people are using it to treat their anxiety. Um, people are using it before exercise. They're finding it very motivating. and. Um, Unfortunately, our government has been studying it for 40 years, but they've been studying it focusing on harm. We've literally spent about $10 billion looking for the harm in cannabis. Ironically, with $10 billion, they haven't found very much. I mean, if you spend $10 billion looking for harm in coffee, like, no one will go near the stuff. Um, but what they found with $10 billion and, you know, tons of careers uh, made and thousands of studies is that adolescents shouldn't smoke it, you shouldn't use it when you're pregnant or breastfeeding, and you shouldn't use it before driving. Hey, that's pretty complicated. Um, I never would have thought of that. But, you know, ironically, it's very, it, it's proven that it's a very safe substance because with all these studies, way more than any other substance, they've, um, they've looked for trouble and haven't really found much. So we know that it's a very safe substance. And then you put it head to head with something like non-steroidals, the, uh, the thing, the, um, the Advil, the ibuprofen, the Naperson, the Aleve that many of my patients are taking uh, year after year as they get older for their arthritic pain, for example. You know, we live till 70, 80, 90 these days. We used to live till 20 or 30 and then something would eat us or hit us over the head. Now we live much longer, but we're sort of a victim of our own success because modern medicine is so good. We live a lot longer, but our bodies weren't really meant or built to live that long and we get pain. And, um, you know, you just can't get away with taking these non-steroidals year after year. So that's why baby boomers are the uh, segment of the population that are adapting uh, cannabis um, more rapidly than any other segment of the population. And I think there is a big role for education. I think that medical cannabis is going to turn into educating baby boomers about how to use cannabis. You know, if they used it when they were younger, it's pretty easy. You just say, take a puff and see what happens. But if they've never used cannabis, it requires a lot of education. They don't know what to expect. They don't know the side effects. They don't know how to smoke. They don't know how to vape. They've never heard of it. So it really does take a lot of um, a lot of education. You have to teach them, no, you don't take a huge brownie the first time because then you'll be you know anxious for four days straight and you'll never touch it again. You know, there's just a lot of education that has to take place. But I do think it is somewhat of a artificial artificial dichotomy between medical and recreational cannabis. I think it is the height of hypocrisy that the alcohol industry and the pharmaceutical industry paid for these ads to show how scary cannabis is when it's safer than alcohol and alcohol use goes down and it's safer than many of the pharmaceuticals that are now being supplanted. Um, and I think that what it's all going to come down to is patient empower empowerment and wellness. And I think that um, this is a really interesting area where the patients are way ahead of the doctors. You know, 90% of patients support it, but the doctors don't know much about it. So I'm involved in a group, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, and we and a lot of other groups are working to educate doctors because if patients can't come and talk to their doctors about medical cannabis, because A, the doctor knows nothing about it, or B, the doctor has a snooty and dismissive attitude. You know, if the doctor says, you don't use marijuana, do you? You know, of course the patient's gonna say, I don't, I, I don't use marijuana, of course not, doctor. You know, the patients are just either not gonna mention to the doctor, so the doctor won't know about drug interactions, the doctor won't 
know how to maximize the use of cannabis and how to advise the patient. So I think the doctors have to, you know, be a little bit more humble, say, I don't know as much about this as I need to, and I've been wrong about this. Doctors need to be open-minded. Um, the endocannabinoid system is the neurotransmitter system by which cannabis acts. You know, there's a cannabinoid receptor type 1 in the brain, which is why it has psychoactive effects and can help with sleep and anxiety, depression and PTSD, and there's the cannabinoid number two receptors in your immune system, which is why it can help with fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, etc. And this neurotransmitter system is only taught right now in 13% of medical schools. I mean, how is that even possible? It's a huge neurotransmitter system. And um, the medical establishment in this country is largely taking the ostrich approach to it. They're sticking their head in the sand and hoping it'll disappear. Now, that's not the most effective approach towards uh, a scientific problem or a therapeutic uh, treatment plan. So we're very strongly encouraging medical schools to teach it, interns to learn it, residents to learn it, and um, we're trying to establish continuing medical education classes for physicians because it, physicians just have to know about this. It's utterly responsible for them to not, to, not to. So anyways, this is just um, to sum up that um, we need more education for physicians. We need, uh, I love the fact that we have so much patient empowerment. Um, a lot of the time it's not a clear-cut case of a patient's using it medically or recreationally, but it doesn't really matter. It's just really helping people. And I think that um, the revolution that we're seeing, we're in a very exciting time right now where, you know, my dad wrote a book about cannabis in 1971, which was pro-cannabis, and he got a lot of crap for it, but he also got a lot of um, a lot of accolade. He, it was called Marijuana Reconsidered. Um, it was inter it was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times Book Review, and it was a very controversial book in 1971. And it's just amazing. He's 90 years old. 90 years old now to see to be at hemp to be at the Harvest Cup and to see how far we've come since 1971. And it's just very exciting to think about what the next few decades are going to hold as we uh, legalize it completely, as we start understanding more about the separate different cannabinoids and what they can do, and as we educate physicians, start studying the endocannabinoid system, and start really um, utilizing cannabis for, for wellness and for, for lifestyle improvements. I'm very excited to be part of it. So thank you. I certify patients for cannabis. Technically, you don't prescribe it. And it's a, that's a little bit uncomfortable for doctors because we sign something and then the patient can go to a dispensary and work with the bug tender and get whatever they want. If you had high blood pressure, I wouldn't give you something that says, you can get blood pressure medications. And then you go to a blood pressure store and can get whatever blood pressure medications you want. So that is something that doctors have to get used to. Um, usually for blood pressure, I give you a specific dose of a specific medication. And that's not how it works with cannabis. So some doctors are just having a little bit of trouble getting used to that. No other drug works like that. So in all fairness to doctors, that is uh, an adjustment they have to make. Oh yeah, absolutely. I make recommendations, but I'm interested. I've always been interested in this, and I know about it. But um, you know, if you're an average, like a, a doctor that doesn't know much about it, you could um, you could certify someone and uh, rely on the bud tender who may know a ton or may not know much at all. Or you could try to refer someone to a medical cannabis specialist, but there's so few of us. So it is somewhat of a problem because patients expect specific, specific recommendations and uh, most doctors don't have specific recommendations. And in truth, there aren't great educational materials yet. So while I'm saying doctors need to be better educated, uh, there aren't phenomenal resources yet for physicians to get better education. But the first step is an open mind, and we're still working on the open mind for the, rec for the educational materials to be entered into. So. Can you speak 
what influence your dad had on you and your choice of career? Oh, absolutely. Um, as I was growing up, I was so sick of hearing the word cannabis. I wanted to hang myself uh, every time I heard it because, like, I, I'm, I'm half joking, but yeah, we made, we, you know, all kinds of cannabis luminaries over my house. My childhood was a household was a continuous cloud of marijuana smoke, and um, you know, my my brother Danny um, and died of leukemia, and he used uh, medical cannabis to eat. This was before we had Zofran and a lot of the modern medications to alleviate nausea. So at an early age, um, I had personal experience that it works uh, medicinally. So I was a believer very early on, because it actually was the only thing that allowed him to maintain his weight. So I knew that it worked medicinally. I wasn't, it wasn't hypothetical to me. It was like actual knowledge. So I was a believer very early on. Um, and then, um, you know, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. I, I wasn't in a hurry. I spent five years working um, at a pretty high level at Greenpeace for five years before medical school, and I was a philosophy major in college. So I figured I was going to be a doctor. I might as well do as much interesting things as I could before entering the conveyor belt of being a doctor. Uh, but I always knew that I was going to be a doctor. And then, um, you know, I, there wasn't that much opportunity to be a medical cannabis specialist 15 years ago. It just wasn't legal. I did my uh, senior... Um, uh, presentation on medical cannabis at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in the year 2000, but it was more sort of hypothetical because we couldn't prescribe it, we couldn't really recommend it. Uh, but now that there's opportunity to actually certify patients and counsel them and they could actually use it, um, I've sort of been uh, very much enjoying uh, helping people work with it, both medicinally and lifestyle-wise. Pregnancy that said in some cases that it was okay or that it was not necessarily bad. The current status is that we don't know fully the effects on pregnancy. Um, as a physician, I'm obligated to say if we don't know, you shouldn't use it when you're pregnant. Though um, there has been a lot of uh, fear mongering, and I think that we actually don't know for sure. You know, um, people have morning sickness. Um, I don't think Zofran, which a lot of people use, is very safe at all during pregnancy. So I think an interesting question would be, compared to what? The pregnant woman can't use nothing. I think they're going to develop cannabinoids. It might not be whole plant cannabis, but that's the thing. There are 100 chemicals in cannabis. They're going to find some cannabinoids that work for nausea during pregnancy that are not dangerous to the fetus. Um, I don't think they know yet about um, full plant cannabis. I don't know if it's ethical to do studies on pregnant women, so I don't know if they're going to know. Um, it's, it's just, um, there's been a lot of fear mongering. Um, it's unethical if we don't know to say go ahead and use it, and I think that the jury's sort of still out, but if the jury's out as a physician, the ethical thing to do is just say don't use it when you're pregnant, but again, then what do you use, and is it really worse than the stuff that we are prescribing? So it's sort of um, you know, lesser of evils type situation. But that's often the case when someone's pregnant. Um, a lot of the medications are class C, meaning there could be harm to the fetus. And, you know, but as opposed to what? Dying of a kidney infection? You know, so we have to use them anyway. So it just, um, you pick your poison. So that's the fun part of being a primary care doctor. You're always making a decision that makes one problem better but could make another problem worse. So that's why it's so relaxing and peaceful being a primary care doctor. So. If anybody's interested in a copy of my book, Free Refills, we do have a few copies up here that I'm willing to sign. If anybody's interested, it's about um, a memoir. I'm 11 years in recovery from opiate addiction, and I wrote a memoir about physicians and addiction, if anybody's interested. And thank you guys very much. So this is great. Thank you.